very much. I'd like to begin by thanking the organisers uh, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, so today <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, Jacoby Alzheimer's on the two loop quiver, which is, um, um, well, there's going to be no quivers in my talk at all. I'm going to quickly um, make the setting more specific, but I want to put the title up uh, because it is part of a wider story, uh, which I'll try to tell at least parts of that wider story and uh, some of the applications that come out of this uh, work. And this is joint work in a seemingly never ending project uh, with Gavin Brown. Uh, we're hoping to post the archive uh, next month. <clears throat> okay, so the plan of the talk is that there is a plan and there's four parts. So I want to begin by saying a little bit about Jacobi algebras um, and it's entirely algebraic. So the, the first part is I'm going to pose you a pretty random sounding algebra problem. And it's going to sound not just a little bit random, uh, but completely hopeless. And I'm going to try to convince you that it's um, actually a worthwhile algebra problem and it's not hopeless. And there are some sort of results that you could hope to prove. <clears throat> then I'm going to say a little bit about um, the motivation about why we're thinking about this purely algebraic problem. And that comes from really trying to classify threefold flops, smooth threefold flops. And it turns out in the process of doing this, um, somehow the divisors of curve contractions somehow come for free in some sense. And so although we're not quite at the stage of being able to classify, one of the remarkable things is that if you try to classify threefold flops, actually divisors to curve contractions somehow uh, come along with them. And the third part is this result in type A and D, and that's in inverted commas. Uh, because those results are purely algebraic, it's got nothing to do with our motivation. It's entirely algebraic. And then from those results, we get uh, very, very concrete geometric consequences. And I'll try to outline uh, some of them. And if you have any questions, uh, do shout at me because I can't see anybody. And so I have no idea if anybody's listening. <laughs> good, good. OK, so here's the algebraic setup. So what's my sort of random problem in algebra? that I would like to think about. So here is the free algebra in two non-commuting variables. So as I emphasize this is not the polynomial ring, it's the free algebra. So X and Y do not commute. So here is a typical element in the free algebra. So it's just a sum of monomials and I'm allowed scalars in my complex numbers and I'm allowed any monomials I want so long as this is a finite sum. And so I'm emphasizing here that XY is appearing and YX is appearing, <clears throat> and these two things are different. So if I relate this back to the title of my talk, this is the path algebra on the two loop quiver. And so you can ask what I'm about to ask for more general quivers, uh, but today I'm going to restrict myself entirely uh, to the free algebra, so the two loop quiver. And in many ways, this is exactly the test case uh, for many of the uh, problems that come later. So I'm interested in classifying. So I want to classify certain objects. And so we think a little bit um, geometrically. So for example, if you want to classify things that are singular, um, first you're gonna to have to think about, well, can I classify things that are smooth? And of course the answer is kind of. So there are plenty of, smooth local commutative rings, um, but you need to go suitably local for there only to be one smooth point. And so in algebraic geometry, you have to go to the completion or the hensalization, or you have to work at least suitably local, suitably locally for the, any chance to be a classification to exist. And so that same principle applies here. And so I'm not actually going to be studying the free algebra in two variables. I'm going to be studying its completed version which is essentially the same, except now you're allowed infinite sums of non-commutative monomials. And so my sum could go on forever. And so the point really I'm making in this slide is that the setup is quite elementary. You could uh, tell this to an undergraduate. Um, and these rings kind of do look kind of cute and fluffy, um, but actually they are probably the most horrific rings you can possibly work in. Um, in algebra. So they're both, neither of them are Noetherian rings, and they also grow in the most horrific way. So whilst the polynomial ring grows polynomially in its monomials, 
uh, these um, grow exponentially. So the, the technical term for that exponential growth is GK infinity. And that has kind of huge computational problems later, as well as, well as the obvious sort of human things. And so if I, again, if I just pick a random element uh, in this uh, uh, completed free algebra, I mean, it, there's, there's a lot of elements, right? It's infinite sums and x, y doesn't commute with y, x. So there's just a lot and lots of coefficients. So again, the point of this slide is just see how many coefficients I have uh, on my arbitrary element. Okay, so that's the setup. And so inside that setup, I want to give myself uh, the option of choosing an element and then differentiating it. <clears throat> so um, we all like to think we know what differentiation means. And so certainly let's just think um, what the properties of differentiation you should have. And so no matter what setting you're in, if you differentiate x squared, you should probably get 2x. And so I'm going to give you a definition here uh, that seems a bit complicated, but all it is doing is ensuring that x squared differentiates to 2x and not 1x. So what do we do? So we pick an arbitrary element of the free algebra or its completed version. And there's a certain one is differentiation, where I can differentiate with respect to x, or I can differentiate with respect to y. And this really is just a simple rule. So just view it as a rule. And on monomials, it's defined as follows. So I'm just going to do x cubed y. So remember, we're working non-commutatively here, so it's a little bit delicate. And so first of all, I just write it as x, 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 y. So this is x cubed y. And uh, what I'm going to do is cyclically permute it. So that means I take my x and I move my x uh, to the right. And so I move this x and it comes here. And so I'm x, x, y, x. And I do the same. I take the first element here. I move it to the right. And I get uh, the x moves there. And then there's the, my x here. I move it to the right. And then when I move this to the right, I get back to where I started. With, and so I stop. And so this is the cyclic permutation of my element. And so from here, what is differentiation? Well, differentiation, if I want to differentiate with respect to x, I just look at all elements that begin with x on the left. So this one, this one, this one, this, this one doesn't, so I ignore it. So I look at the first three elements because they begin with x, and I just score off that x. And so I score off the three x's, and I get x squared y, x, y, x and y x squared. And if I want to differentiate with respect to y, I play the same game. I just look at all possible monomials that start with y, and I score it off. And so there's only one. I score it off and get x cubed. And so again, just to parse through, this is not an unreasonable definition. If I, if I told you that x cubed y differentiates to 3x squared y, you'd believe me. And essentially, if this was commutative, this would be 3x squared y, um, but we're not commutative, so you know, it is this thing here. So it's not an unreasonable uh, definition. <clears throat> and so from this, again, what do I do? I pick my arbitrary element in my completed free algebra in two variables, and I form the Jacobi algebra, which is just basically, I take the ideal generated by the two thing differentiation, I take the ideal generated by it, and I form the quotient ring. And this is a, an algebra. And the sort of small technical thing is because our um, ring isn't Noetherian, ideals are not closed. And so I have to close my ideal to get some reasonable ring. And this double bracket just means take the ideal and take its closure. And so it's quite important, the closure from this sort of technical aspect. Um, but for the vast majority of today, uh, you can completely ignore that closure and just pretend that it doesn't exist. Okay, and here's an question in the audience. Very typical point. You made a, a yeah. big fuss about the ring being non non commutative. However, when you yeah. differentiate an object, it doesn't depend. It, it only depends on the abelianizing. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. You're right. You're right. <laughs> and so, in some sense, and this is a very important actually. Um, you're you're right. Um, so it's it's only um depending on the cyclic permutation class. Yeah, you're right. And so here's an example I want to give, um, just to say this theory is somehow non-trivial. So if I differentiate uh, this object with respect to x, it should not surprise you. That gives you 4x cubed plus y squared. And I differentiate with respect to y, I should get 2xy, 
kind of, but of course in non-commutative land, uh, lands be an x, y plus y x. So I take the closure and I have an algebra. And this is quite a remarkable algebra. So what is the intuition uh, you should have for this algebra? So on one hand, you'd stare at the second relation and you think, well, that's kind of saying that x and y commute. They don't commute, they anti-commute. But you'd sort of like to think that's is roughly saying you're a polynomial ring in one variable. And then you have a, a curve in a polynomial ring in one variable. So you think, roughly speaking, this should have dimension one as an algebra. However you me measure dimension, your intuition would say it's dimension one, or crawl dimension one. Um, but your intuition would be incredibly wrong in this situation. And it, it turns out this algebra is finite dimensional as a vector space. And so when the anti-commutator really messes things up, and this algebra, it turns out, it's not entirely obvious, it turns out this algebra has dimension nine as a vector space. And that's kind of quite remarkable because uh, we started out with some object, uh, which is um, the largest sort of possible growth you can have, so GK infinity. We've done some pretty elementary operation. We've taken a quotient and we've got an algebra on exactly the opposite end of the spectrum, some of the smallest possible algebra you can have. So it's um, finite dimensional as a vector space, that's GK zero. And so that's an example of a Jacobi algebra. Okay, and so here's the question. Uh, the question is, I would like to classify all possible Jacobi algebras up to isomorphism. And so um, again, uh, there are versions of this questions for other quivers, but today I really am focusing on the two loop quiver. So I'm in the free algebra and two variables or the completed version of it if I want to classify. And so I want to subdivide that problem into pieces and so really I want to fix my GK dimension for the dimension of the answer. So to calibrate yourself, GK zero is finite dimensional algebras. So let's just feed that. So for every N big and equal to zero, I want to produce a set of potentials or these elements and from which we can realize every Jacobi algebra of that fixed GK dimension up to isomorphism. And in particular, if you plug in N equals zero, what I'm asking to do is to produce a set of potentials which realizes every finite dimensional Jacobi algebra up to isomorphism. And so this is quite an outrageous question. And so um, if you want to make it just slightly more outrageous, you furthermore want to solve the identification problem. So if I hand you two algebras, in general, it's really hard to know if they're isomorphic or not. Um, but actually what we're going to do is we're insisting we're also going to solve that problem. And so we want the elements to be in normal form. So if I take two um, distinct elements in my set, then the resulting Jacobi algebras are definitely not isomorphic. So not only do I want to realize all the algebras, I want to say that actually and here are the exact precise um, isomorphism classes. And so just as notation later, it's a little bit cheeky, I'm going to say F is isomorphic to G, really to mean that Jacobi algebras are isomorphic. And so to certain experts in the room, what I'm not saying is that there's an algebra automorphism that takes F to G. I'm just saying that I'm allowing myself more flexibility. I just want the Jacobi algebras to be isomorphic. And so that's the kind of algebraic question. And if you'd asked me this question even maybe a year ago, I'd have pretty much laughed at you to say there's absolutely no chance uh, that you're going to be able to do this. And so here's our proposal. Um, and so I'm going to tell you what the proposal is, and then I'm going to try to back up that proposal with some um, evidence and some results. And so here's the proposal. The proposal is that at least for small n, um, first of all, <laughs> the classification is desirable. So this isn't just like a random algebra question that we can assign sort of to other people. I actually want a classification. And I'm hoping at least by the end of the talk, uh, the desirability uh, should at least be settled. And I'm going to say four other things and they're going to increase in the level of outrageousness. And then the first thing is that we're, we're insisting at least for small n, and so n being zero and one for us would be small, that the classification actually is possible. We think there's going to be a classification and we're going to go say, here it is. And maybe I can just pause to say a little bit about this, that um, actually I think I'm going to, the rest of the talk is going to be all about flops and birational geometry. Um, but really, I think to me, this is actually the, perhaps the bigger sort of fundamental point, right? So 
Arnold, what he did in the 70s is he did the somehow the commutative version. So you fix the power series ring in two variables, commutative, and you try to classify certain singularities within that. And so you're using Jacobi and Milner algebras to do that. And Arnold produces for you a list of reasonable answers. And of course, there's technical assumptions that he adds as the simple singularities, the modularity has got certain, well, there's technical things there, but essentially what Arnold is doing is producing a list of isomorphism classes. And singularity theorists in sort of since then have been continuing um, by just getting more and more semi-technical. So that you, their technical conditions increase and increase and increase. And what we're saying is that not to do that, instead of fixing the commutative polynomial ring and then classifying, um, we just change the, the initial object to make it non-commutative and you just ask elementary questions from this. And so we're hoping to find a list of answers, which is somehow the non-commutative version of Arnold's classification. Uh, so end philosophy. And so the second part of the proposal, uh, which is um, pretty outrageous, is that there are no moduli. And so if you think back uh, to what uh, your typical element in, in the three algebra looks like, there are a lot of contentious parameters in that choice. And, but we're, we're claiming, at least for small n, uh, that there are there's no moduli, no continuous parameters, just a very few countable families. And so that's only backed, backed up by evidence we have no philosophy a priori uh, to expect that. And so the third thing, um, which is um, bordering on sort of insanity, is that the classification you're going to get, at least for small n, is AGE. And so this should surprise you because nothing of what I've said so far on the face of it has got absolutely anything to do with ADE Dinkin diagrams. And then the fourth part, which is to do with conjectures, which I'm just about to sort of talk about in a few minutes, if my time is good, um, is that actually um, this algebraic classification, so this part of mathematics, is exactly the same mathematics as the classification of flops and of prepent de Vosorel contractions to curves. So somehow, um, yeah, this is the classification in birational geometry of flops. And it is also somehow for free, we weren't expecting this, um, um, also prepent de Vosorel contractions to curves. So somehow aim for flops and you hope the other comes for free. And certainly number four isn't there yet, but again, I'll try to sort of outline some of the evidence towards that. And so that's the proposal. Um, and it's a little bit outrageous. Good. And so um, I'm going to talk you through now, let's back up. Um, why would we be interested in talking about such questions? Let me back up to there. And so um, one class of contracts or, or Jacobi algebras uh, comes from birational geometry. And so here is my two cartoon pictures of where that appears in dimension three. So here we are. So I have... Um, I've stripped out the technical um, assumptions here, so let me talk you through what they are. And so either I have a flopping contraction of threefold. So what does this mean? So I have some sort of Clabiau threefold, at least locally around the curve Clabiau, and I have a single curve in that, um, in that space, and I can track that single curve to a point. And there's some technical assumptions that um, you need to satisfy. Um, but I'm wanting my, my flopping contraction at X, I want X to be smooth. And so there are loads of these in rational geometry, and so that's one of the settings. And the other setting is a crepent divisorial contraction to curve. So I take this whole sheet of paper and I squish it to a point, and so squish it to a line. And so the divisor, which is the bit of paper, is contracted into a line, which is a curve. And so again, the, the assumption today is that X is smooth and, and I'm suitably local around the origin, so I am going to assume R is complete local. So really there's only one point and above that point is a single curve. And of course, you could try this game for more curves uh, and for other things, that's fine. It uh, just means um, you have to do other quivers. The, the talk becomes more technical. But ultimately X being smooth is important. And for today, I'm going to talk about one curve above the origin. So that's my two geometry settings. And so and to this data, uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, myself and Will associated an object called the contraction algebra. And so I just briefly want to explain 
uh, what this object is. OK, and so the contraction algebra is somehow detecting deformation theory of your fiber. And so whenever you do deformation theory, you have to think through what deformation theory you're picking uh, because you have a choice. And so the contraction algebra is defined using something called non-commutative deformation theory. And you have a choice of do you take the reduced fiber or the non-reduced fiber. There's a whole bucket load of choices. Um, but for today, um, uh, somehow all this is irrelevant. You only need to know two facts. And the two facts you need to know is that this algebra, which today you should view as a magic algebra coming from non-commutative deformation theory. Since I have only a single curve, this algebra is a factor of the, essentially the free algebra in two variables or its completed version. And the second fact you need to know is that since X is smooth, actually the factor you're taking is a Jacobi algebra for some F. And so there's a whole technology to, behind given a contraction, you produce an algebra. Um, but ultimately today, you just read as well, all you're doing is the sum factor of these algebras that you're taking. And the third fact you need for today is a theorem that I proved with Will maybe 2015, is that um, this algebra is really detecting the local geometry and can distinguish between the two types of contractions. And so the situation one, which is this flopping contraction, uh, so I've written this in a very sort of pretentious way, Basically, you are a flopping contraction if and only if your contraction algebra is finite dimensional as a vector space. And so if I put that into more fancy language that matches my earlier part of my talk, my, I am a flopping contraction if and only if my algebra is as small as possible, so it's finite dimensional as a vector space or GK0, um, a divisorial contraction to a curve if and only if my GK dimension is precisely one. And so the, the one is matching the dimension of the curve, uh, which is supported on. And so in particular, uh, because the contraction algebra is a Jacobi, this motivates us wanting to study and perhaps classify Jacobi algebras of small GK dimension, where small is zero and one. And I do appreciate that you want a very small and there are other small numbers. Uh, but for today, when I say small, I really do mean zero or one. Good. And so um, let me just talk you through the two conjectures uh, that are linked to the things I'm about to talk to. And the first conjecture is um, the classification conjecture that myself and Will gave back in 2013, is that actually these contraction algebras are the classification of flops. And also, well, not at the time, but also now the result contractions to curves. So let me just make that a little bit more precise. So I have two flopping contractions. So X1 goes to spec R1, X2 to spec R2. And of course, they have to be somehow the same setup, right? So they both have to be smooth. Uh, they both have to have um, one, one curve above the origin. They're both suitably local. And they have contraction algebras. Uh, a and B. So you have a contraction algebra associated to the first, which is A con, and a contraction algebra associated to the second, uh, B con. Then the two base rings are isomorphic as rings, so these flopping contractions somehow are the same, or as the same as they can be, um, if and only if these two algebras are isomorphic. And so if you parse through why that's a simplification, well, in the case of flops, um, these objects are finite dimensional algebras. And so you're saying that the flops are classified by certain finite dimensional non commutative algebras. And you, you'd be saying uh, that divisorial contractions to curves are classified by certain non commutative algebras of GK1. Uh, so certainly uh, the finite dimensional algebra, that's a simplification. Three dimensional geometries you'd think would be more complicated. Are they just finite dimensional algebras? And so that's the conjecture. And then the second conjecture, um, <laughs> which is by far more outrageous, is that actually all Jacobi algebras, at least for small n, are contraction algebras. And so a priori, contraction algebras dump you into Jacobi algebras, but the conjecture is that actually uh, they are everything. Um, there aren't any others. <laughs> 
And so again, to make that a little bit more precise, if I take an arbitrary element whose Jacobi algebra has small GK dimension, then I can construct, or it's possible to construct either a flopping contraction or a divisorial con curve contraction, uh, which realizes that random choice of F that I started with. And I think basically at no stage of my life until the last six months, have I believed this conjecture is going to be true. Uh, but now I really do believe uh, both conjectures actually are going to be true. So let me just talk you through uh, some of the recent results with Gavin and I um, that sort of lead, lend some weight uh, to this object. And so here we go. So what we're going to do from here on in, from here on in, we're just going for, for the next little bit, we're going to completely ignore the geometry. So blind to any geometry, we're going to go off on our merry way, algebraic way, and we're going to try to classify uh, the possible Jacobi algebras. And we're going to try to do that first using only algebra, and then at the end, we're going to try to we're going to relate this to geometry and get some consequences out. And so some rules for the game. So scalars differentiate to zero, so you can just rule out scalars to begin with. Since we're complete local, um, if I have a linear term X or a linear term Y, that differentiates to a unit, and so the Jacobi algebra is zero, and we like to think we understand the zero ring. And so really the rules of the game is I can ignore those two cases, and I can assume my random choice of element uh, contains only quadratic terms and higher. So X squared, X, Y, Y, X, X cubed, Y, etc. And so just as a piece of notation, I'm going to write this as F um, is in the free algebra essential or the completed version with quadratic terms or a higher. Good. And so I'm going to talk you through type A. And so type A is in inverted commas because I'm blind to the geometry at the moment. And later it really is going to be type A. Um, but at the moment, I'm just doing algebra. So I'm just taking, uh, a, so the type A case is going to be when F, so I choose my random element. And I'm going to just assume that it contains a quadratic term. And so any quadratic term at all. And so F can be, it can contain, here's a quadratic term X, Y, here's another one. Of course, it's a power series. So there's a bucket load of other stuff it could possibly contain. Yep. And so again, just think about the number of parameters here. There's a parameter on your quadratic term <laughs> for every other term in this infinite sum, uh, there is a uh, scalar. So, so, so it's a pretty big object. And so here's your sort of warm up result. And so I have uh, F with only quadratic terms or higher, and there is a quadratic term. And then actually uh, the Jacobi algebra of F is isomorphic to the Jacobi algebra either of this object or of this object uh, where n is bigger than equal to two. Yep, and so <laughs> no parameters. Uh, your parameters are either zero or one. And in all cases, I haven't, uh, there's no restrictions on the top. So in all situations, it falls out for free that my algebra has got small growth, so small dimension, GK dimension one. It turns out for free, which isn't obvious to begin with, that the Jacobi algebra is commutative. And it falls out for free that either the Jacobi algebra is the essentially the polynomial ring of one variable or its complete version, or it's a factor, or a really nice factor of the polynomial ring in one variable. And this is a kind of, in some sense, a non-commutative Morse lemma. Except that somehow the Morse lemma, I, I kind of view it as somehow being in topology and having a kind of conceptual proof. Uh, whereas here, this is just a brutal algebraic formal change of variables proof. There's nothing particularly delightful about the proof of this result. But nonetheless, it is true. And so um, two notes um, to give you for this is that um, the assumptions to the warm up results Look, in some ways, artificial, right? So I choose an arbitrary element which has got quadratic terms or higher. Well, in some ways, um, you'd expect most of the time to have a quadratic term because, like, otherwise, some things have to be zero, and being zero is somehow difficult. And so you'd expect there to be a quadratic term. And in fact, um, 
having a quadratic term is equivalent um, to the Jacobi algebra being commutative. And so if I went to, to classify those that are commutative, that would be somehow, I think, fairly natural. And again, uh, the second point, um, which is this inconvenient fact in the maths, is that <laughs> most algebras are semi-simple, right? If I, if I write down an algebra completely at random, uh, you should expect the answer to either be zero, the zero ring, or a semi-simple ring. And in this situation, so therefore you should expect most of the time uh, your, your answer just to be the complex numbers. And so why should that be true? Well, if I pick an F completely at random, um, most of the time there's a quadratic term. And then if I take that quadratic term and just view it as a commutative polynomial, so I take it's a delinization, I have a quadratic polynomial and two variables. Most of the time, that's got two distinct roots. I mean, sometimes it has a repeated root, but most of the time it has two distinct roots. And that's exactly the case x squared plus y squared. Otherwise, it's only got one repeated root, and that's the case x squared. So the generic behavior is, is two distinct roots. So the generic behavior is x squared plus y squared. So generically, I'm getting the, just the complex numbers out. So in particular, um, this is a very unimpressive classification result, uh, but nonetheless, it's a classification result. It's saying, at least for small things, uh, you can say exactly what it is. So I view this as being type A. Good. And so this should remind you of something. And so if you go back to Miles's Pagoda paper, which somehow, in many ways, somehow founded the sort of foundations of the MMP, um, he tells us that for type A contractions of a single curve, um, one of two things can happen. Either you have a genuine scroll where your curve genuinely moves in a one parameter family. And he proves that there's only one situation that can occur in, which is this. So UV is equal to S squared inside affine four space. Or your curve moves in an infinitesimal scroll, uh, depending only on a single parameter M, in which case this is his example of a pagoda flop. And if I compute the contraction algebra for both these situations, what do I get? Well, the contraction algebra for um, situation one is precisely the first algebra that was on my previous slide. And if I do the contraction algebra um, for this object, what do we get? Um, we get exactly the contraction algebras, the algebras that were on my previous slide. And so essentially what I'm telling you here is myself and Gavin have done a random calculation in algebra and produced a, an answer. Uh, Miles has done a completely different calculation in birational geometry, and those answers are the same. Of course, this is just how I'm presenting it. Uh, there is a deeper connection than this. Um, but how I present it, this is rampantly unimpressive, uh, partly because really there's not so many factors of this ring and so, you know, it's a little bit like going to the zoo and finding a hamster. There are more exotic creatures uh, than these things here. But nonetheless, this should be giving you at least a hint of the idea about why this classification in this free algebra should at least be related to the birational geometry of free points. Good. And so to continue classifying, so we're going off on our merry way through algebra, again, blind to any geometry, so we've already done the situation where there's a quadratic term and it's only those things in type A that are appearing. And so next up is only those objects that contain a cubic term or higher. And so um, there's a result of um, Natalia Yudu and collaborators that if you have small GK dimension, actually you need to have a cubic term. And so on one hand, that's a very positive result because it's somehow says you're almost there. Um, but on the other hand, there is a lot of cubic terms, or there's certainly more than you imagine, uh, in the free algebra in two variables. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to assume that our quadratic term is zero because we've classified those. And we're going to assume that our cubic term is non-zero. And we're going to play the same trick that we played before. So I take my cubic term and I view it, well, it's, it's a non-commutative polynomial in two variables. 
So I just commute my variables and I get an honest to goodness polynomial cubic in two variables. And I can ask how many roots or how many factors does this commutative polynomial have? Now, of course, again, most of the time you'd expect it to be three distinct roots. Sometimes you get two roots, two distinct roots. And if you're extremely unlucky, you'd have one root repeated three times. And so this is splitting us into some subcases. And so what's going to be the case and what I talk later is that most of the time you'd expect three roots and that's going to be the generic type D behavior. Sometimes you're going to have two roots, which is still going to be type D. And if you're extremely unlucky, <laughs> which of course, how often you are, <laughs> um, then you're going to be the exceptional or type E case. And so I'm just going to do, I'm going to talk you through. And so what myself and Gavin have solved is we've solved exactly um, the sort of the two or three factors case where we can classify in this situation. And we've got some results in the other ones, but this is how it's looking. Good. So here's our theorem. So we consider that we pick at random, again, where are we? We're in the power series ring in two variables, non-commutative. We pick an element at random, which, which is um, only cubic terms are high and there is a cubic term. And we assume that it's a Boolean So this cubic term viewed as a commutative polynomial has two or three distinct factors or roots, depending on your language. So that happens most of the time. Um, then the Jacobi algebra has very, very few options. So the Jacobi algebra is either on the nose, isomorphic to the Jacobi algebra of that single potential, or you can add in x to the even, or you could have added in x to the odd, or you could have added in both. And the theorem is, that's it. There's nothing else. And so let me just talk you through the cases a little bit because it's a little bit delicate. So what are my cases? So my cases are x, y squared. I can add in an odd term, or I could add in an even term, or I could have both. And the both cases, either the even term is smaller than the odd term, or the odd term is smaller than the even term. And that's what these um, things are saying for you. And it, so this is a, the a true theorem, as I've stated it, the Jacobi algebra is isomorphic to Jacobi algebra of one of these elements. And so if you think right back, um, I also wanted to say um, that I wanted this list to be in normal form. So I didn't want there to be any algebras in this list that were isomorphic to each other. And it turns out actually that some in this family are isomorphic to some in this family if this is, is much larger than this. And so to get our normal forms, the only thing we have to add in is a restriction that tells you that this odd number is not too much larger uh, than this even number. And there you go, there's your normal forms. That's it. <laughs> and for free, uh, right at the end of the calculation, uh, no stage in the middle of the calculation did we expect this. The GK dimension is automatically less than or equal to one. And the other most, the, probably the more outrageous thing is that there are no moduli. There are very few countable families. So I have a single object here. I have a countable family here. And I have you know, some countable objects I see here. And uh, yeah, that's the theorem. Good. So I can't hear um, anything now. It seems to go blank. Hopefully some people are still listening. I'll just keep going. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so then you go back to the realization conjecture of myself and Gavin, which is a little bit outrageous. So it's saying, if I choose a Jacobi algebra at random, which is either finite dimensional or it's got GK1, then I can realize it from birational geometry, 
And so I have a list here of the possible Jacobi algebras that can that can come. This is a, an algebraic classification. And so now I just ask myself the geometric question, can we realize them in by rational geometry? And the answer is yes. And so um, this Jacobi algebra here appeared in a paper of myself and Will as the contraction algebra of a D4 divisorial contraction for a curve. Now, this potential here, when M is one, appears in my, one of my papers with Will, um, but we needed to generalize. So one of the things that come out in the paper with Gavin that's going to be on the archive is that we can construct a divisorial contraction to a curve uh, with this contraction algebra. And we constructed it maybe four years ago using our computer algebra searches. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a new family of D4 divisorial contractions to curve, all of which are mutually non-isomorphic, as uh, suggested um, by this classification of Jacobi algebra. And so we proved that these things exist. Then uh, for this family here, well, that's the potentials uh, for the famous Laufer family of flops. So those flops exist already. Um, this potential here arose in my, um, when M and N were small, arose in my paper with Gavin about Gopal Kumavafa stuff. And the general case is taken care of by um, Oke van Garden and Kawamata's um, papers on constructing flops with various properties. This is a bit of advertising. Oke is giving a talk. Uh, exactly on this at uh, 12 o'clock in the Lagoon seminar. But anyway, so that family is taken care of. There's a big tick. We can realize them from geometry. And that family there, it's also in the same papers uh, by Oke okay and Kalamata are realized. And so all these potentials are realized from algebraic geometry by rational geometry. And if you believe the conjectures, that's telling you that um, these examples of myself and Will and myself and Gavin are the only D4 divisor contractions to curves. And if you believe the conjectures, these are the only uh, D4 um, flux. And so, so Mike, in all, uh, sorry. Yep. sorry, but yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yep. So I, I'm yeah, a bit please. confused about GK dimension. So all of these are GK dimension one. So sorry, the, the top two are GK1 and the bottom three are GK0. So it's, it's less than or equal to in the last slide, yeah, less than or equal to. Okay, so, oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, so you're quadratic, right. This, this, so quadratic this, is automatically GK0. That was your previous classification result. And cubic is... Yeah, GK... it, no, no, not quite, not quite, because then we just go back. Um, you have to oh, be sorry, careful not, with that, it, yeah, because yeah, you yeah, have okay, this here. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's got that as well. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. And so the again, it's coming back to this sort of quite remarkable thing. That I, I have no way of explaining it or really expecting the GK one just somehow comes for free, right? Some it's there. I mean, we didn't <laughs> we didn't try to classify it. It just sort of comes out. And we were aiming for the GK zero, so the finite dimensional Jacobi's. That's our aim. And the GK one is sort of coming along for the right, which is really neat, but we weren't expecting it. <laughs> And in all cases, so and I was calling this type D because there was no reason for me to call it type D. Um, but in all cases, um, in the corresponding geometric construction, it is a D4. So the elephant, the general elephant, is type D singularities. And there are, although I'm not going to say this because it gets pretty technical, there are non commutative versions of the elephant. And so there's non commutative ways of saying why this should be type D. And so we're, we're pretty um, happy on that. And so I think this is quite Michael. Uh, quite uh, yep. One, what I wanted to ask is, um, so in particular, all of these like three root potentials are equivalent to two root potentials. That's what you're saying. Uh, no, so it's all hidden. This is hidden. So if you, the three roots potential is um sitting in here where m is one. Right, so ah, actually, okay. Okay. Actually, it's a little bit cheeky, um, but yeah. So um, yeah. actually, uh, it's cheeky because the proofs in the two cases are incredibly different. And then right at the end, we shoehorn it into this sort of unified way. Um, but um, yeah, the, they are a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. And is, so is this like a, a length classification or something? Uh, no, so the, the, you, should, you, should, you should view the, the three roots case I'll talk about later as when the first Gopa Kuma Vafin brain is four. And then the, the two roots case is everything else. I'll, I'll talk about, can I talk about it in a few slides forward? Yeah, okay. yeah, of course. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, and so um, 
so there are no modulars. <laughs> so I can't believe this, but it is what it is, um, and we move on. Good. And so the corollary, just to spell this out again, the outrageous conjecture is true now, uh, except there's only one possible remaining case, um, because we know that GK1 has to have a cubic, and up to change of variables, um, there's only one remaining case, is that when your potential is x cubed in degree three, and higher terms of degree four or higher. And that's it. And if you can prove the conjecture in that case, we win. And actually, Jacobi algebras are the same. Uh, they all come from geometry. <laughs> yeah. Good. And so um, here's the next theorem, um, which is related to this question. So, no, we can't prove the conjecture I have with Will yet. Um, but you can ask the question is type D in some sense finished? And so let's just, so the previous slide was saying, um, if I choose these flops that Asim, like Laufer, myself and Gavin, or Oki or Kawamata have written down, then you come into the classification that myself and Gavin have given. But now let's just say that you start with a flop, you find a, a D4 flop completely at random. So you wake up one morning and you just have the equation of a D4 flop in your head. You go, yeah, I've got a flop. And you compute the contraction algebra. How do we know, or do we know, that that contraction algebra you've just computed is in our classification? And the theorem is we do. And it doesn't matter how you constructed your flop. If you can construct a D4 flop, its contraction algebra is isomorphic to one of the ones in our lists. And so this is the theorem. So it's also for divisor contractions, the curves. If you have any smooth D4 flop or divisor contraction to curve, doesn't matter how you construct it. You can construct it by one parameter deformations, slices of universal flops. You can just wake up one morning and find one. And automatically, the contraction algebra associated to that is one of the Jacobi algebras on our previous list. And so it's got a star on the theorem uh, just because it's, it's very recent and the proof is very subtle. It's now written, I'm confident, but you know. <laughs> It's some pretty subtle non commutative changes in variables. Um, but the strategy is very robust. I'm pretty happy with it now. And so in particular, you've chosen at random. And so we've classified all possible contractions of all possible type D flops and the visual contractions the curves. So if it's not on our list. It doesn't exist. That's the logic. Um, in particular, the contraction algebras don't have moduli. There are no continuous parameters. And so if you believe the conjecture I have with Will that this is the classification, it is telling you that in type D single curve flops, there are no moduli as a prediction. In type A, that's fine, but Miles is Pagoda classification. And so, um, yeah, and so the conjectures also suggest but don't yet prove um, that these are all type D flops. And th if that was true, that would extend miles from the 80s. But we're still not quite there yet. Good. And so how am I looking for time? We've got five minutes. Perfect. So I just want to say that um, this is all in some ways, you know, there's a, there isn't a result there, you know, a classification of Jacobi algebras, which is quite surprising. I think it's quite nice and it's got really, I view the sort of Arnold perspective as maybe more fundamental. But it'd be quite, I think it's a legitimate question to ask me is that, you know, this is still quite conjectural in places. Um, can you give us a geometric result in Barrasso geometry three folds using this technology that we can't prove otherwise? And the answer is yes. And here's it is here. And so even if you don't believe the conjectures, there are still geometric corollaries. And so just to um, say what they are, I need to very briefly ramp to what Gopakuma of Affin variants are. So to every flop, there is an associated tuple of numbers called the GV invariants. So how do you get them? So you have a single curve, and you deform your curve into other curves, disjoint union of my, simplest possible curve, minus one, minus one curves, and you just count these um, other ones. So you start with a single one, you split it into pieces, and you count. So you start with one, you split it into pieces, and you get five, five new curves. And so the answer would be five, but you know, a bit more cultured than that, so a bit more refined. So we don't just count the number five. We ask of those curves, how many of those curves have curve class J 
how many to see, etc. So there's actually a little bit more of a refined count happening. But for the purposes of this slide, you should just view this as you take your curve, you split it into pieces and you count curves with particular properties. And that gives you a tuple of numbers. In type A, the Gopakuma Vaf events are precisely this n that appeared in Bukoda and all the rest are zeros. This data n is enough to distinguish elements from the family and all possible n can arise. In type D, it's more complicated. The GV invariants are A and B, and the rest are zero. This type D just means the first two are not non-zero. And different flops can have different curve counting invariants. Okay, we'll be talking about that uh, later at 12. And so the question here is what possible Gopakuma Vaf invariants can arise in type D? And we can now answer this. By our classification of Jacobi algebras, uh, we, can now we can now answer this question. And here is the answer. Uh, the Crawley in type D, the only possible Gopakuma Vaf invariants, well, the first number can be four, and it can have every other number as second number, so it goes on to the right. And so in response to Matt's question, uh, this is the three roots case. This is exactly the three roots case um, for the new there. Then you can have five one, but nothing above it. Then you can have six two and everything above it. You can have seven two by itself, eight three and everything above it, nine three, etc. And how do we realize them? Well, this is again X, this is your three roots case. That's your non commutative part that's realizing it. You can realize that and you can realize the rest. And so the structure is quite remarkable. Either you get an infinite family with a unique contraction algebra or hopefully flop at every point, or you you don't get the infinite family, but at the expense of having more than one isomorphism class. So 5-1 is not an infinite family, but there are two examples with 5-1. 7-2 is not an infinite family, but there are three examples. Whereas the 6 is an infinite family, but there's a unique object at that point. And so just to spell out the logic again, um, what I find remarkable here is, so we can say for sure now there is no D4 flop with Gopakuma of Afrika, it's 5-2, and why, what is the logic? Well, the logic is if you could construct such an object, its contraction algebra has to have certain properties. In particular, it has to be on our list. Um, it's not on our list. Therefore, your geometry example can't exist. And so the obstruction to these gaps in the Gopakuma Vaf invariants is non commutative so It's coming from the contraction algebra. And I've basically done it's some um, five two. So this, let me tell you through, uh, type E is work in progress. Um, so it is hard, mainly computationally. So the smallest contraction algebra in this family has got dimension 28, and most of them are up in the hundreds. So just computationally, this is extremely difficult. Um, in particular, we have found the first infinite family of type E flops, again, using the contraction algebra. You find an object there, then you try to build it. And plus, we found E six to all contractions to curves. So we're using the same technique, essentially. And I am now, you know, confident might be the wrong words, um, but I'm pretty optimistic. Um, the full classification of single curve flop and result contractions curves, it, it might actually be possible. And here is the beginning of such a classification. So again, when I was doing it in brackets earlier, it might look quite sort of um, alarming, but it's not. So here's type A. Type A are those potentials of the following form where C is some number or infinity. So infinity is when you have like thing as zero, so GK1. Or you have type D where you've got this polynomial where this epsilon is either zero or one and you have two numbers N and M and you have type B which is X cubed plus something else. And so I'm hoping that this is going to sort of become the non commutative version of Arnold's list of ADE. And in particular, it's also going to do the sort of flops of resolve contraction to curve uh, at the same time. But I'll stop there with that amount of time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.